In my last talk, I showed why serious origin of life researchers have rejected the chance hypothesis. As more biologists during the 1960s began to realize the extreme complexity and specificity of the information-rich DNA and proteins, they realized that the probability of building such molecules by chance was vanishingly small. Dean Kenyon was one of those scientists. Kenyon was a young biophysicist at San Francisco State University and he was interested in the origin of life. Kenyon decided to develop another approach. He'd done a PhD at Stanford in biophysics and was a po had been a postdoc at the University of California, Berkeley in the laboratory of Melvin Calvin, one of the leading scientists of the day. So Kenyon was steeped in the scientific culture of the late 1960s. Jacques Minot's book had just come out in 1968, and since chance seemed implausible, Kenyon and his colleague, Gary Steinman, decided to try necessity. Except they didn't call it necessity. They called it predestination, biochemical predestination. In 1969, Kenyon and Steinman wrote a book by this title. Through the 1970s and early 1980s, it became the best-selling graduate-level text on the origin of life, and it established Kenyon as a leading researcher in the field. So here was their idea. Remember our discussion of crystals when we were talking about proteins and how the forces of attraction between the sodium and the chloride, for example, in a crystal of salt creates a nice orderly structure, the crystalline structure? Well, Kenyon and Steinman thought something similar might be happening with proteins so that the ordering of the amino acids in a protein might also arise by what they called differential bonding affinities attractions, different degrees of attraction between the different protein-forming amino acids. So if I take this snaplock bead and we, I propose that we're going to ha have it represent one of the amino acids, say tryptophan, we might hypothesize that that amino acid has, uh, attracts another amino acid, like say glycine, with some differential strength, that it prefers to stick to glycine more than it prefers to stick to, say, alanine, another amino acid. So this was their idea, that the sequencing of proteins, these big information-rich molecules, could be explained by reference to the forces of chemical attraction at work between the constituent parts of the protein molecule. But there was a problem with this theory, this theory of differential bonding affinities. And that is that though there are some slight differences in affinity, and this was determined experimentally, these differences are very slight, and they don't correlate to the sequencing of known proteins. So it looked like you actually couldn't explain the origin of the proteins that we know by reference to these forces of chemical necessity. Now, the story takes an interesting turn in 1975, six years after the Biochemical Predestination book is published. Kenyon is challenged by a student in class who points out that for his theory to work, it would also have to explain the information in the DNA molecule. Now, Kenyon thought about this challenge that he encountered in class over a long summer holiday. And he eventually realized that the student was right. And the reason that the student was right is that Kenyon knew that while you, information can go from DNA to RNA to proteins, it would be very difficult to get the information out of proteins going the other direction back into DNA. So he realized that DNA had to come first, or perhaps RNA, but one of those nu uh, nucleic acids had to ha be the first information carriers. But he realized that that wouldn't work and that there was a chemical reason for that. The picture you see shows what's called the chemical formula formulae for the DNA molecule, the structural formula for the DNA molecule. It shows the sugar phosphate backbone on, the, on, the e on each side, with, represented by the pentagons and the circles. On the interior of the molecule, you see the nucleotide bases represented by the familiar letters A, C, G, and T. Now, the information-bearing axis of the molecule is actually those nucleotide bases. The sugar phosphate backbone forms the medium upon which that genetic message is attached. Now, notice also that there are little sticks representing chemical bonds between many of the constituent parts of the molecules, between the sugars, represented by the pentagons, the phosphates, represented by the, sugar, by the circles. And notice there's also a chemical bond between 
the sugar phosphate backbone, and each of the nucleotide bases. But now notice also that there is no stick connecting the individual nucleotide bases in that horizontal or that vertical axis. What that shows is that there's no chemical at attachment between the individual nucleotide bases. But if there's no chemical attach attachment, no chemical bond between them, there can be no differential bonding affinity between the A's and the C's and the G's and the T's. In other words, there's no chemical reason that the A's and the C's and the G's and the T's would line up in any specific arrangement. Now notice one more thing about the molecule. Notice that there's a bond between each nucleotide base and the sugar phosphate backbone. Turns out that bond is the same in every case. It's called an N-glycosidic bond in chemistry. And what that means is that any one of those nucleotide bases can attach to the sugar phosphate backbone at any site along the backbone with equal facility. None is preferred, none is rejected. So again, the chemistry of attraction doesn't determine the arrangement of the bases along that sugar phosphate backbone or in relation to each other. Now, all this chemistry may be somewhat unfamiliar to you, so I have a, a, a visual illustration that draws an analogy between what's going on in the chemistry and what's going on in the illustration that may make this principle clear. I have here a message written on a magnetic letter board. The letters stick to the magnetic letter board because of the magnets in them. Now notice the message, rain or shine by the way, appropriate for Seattle, mostly we have rain, not shine. But in any case, notice that there are no magnetic forces of attraction between the letters in the message. That's similar to the DNA case. No bonding or bonding affinities explain the sequential arrangement of the letters in the information bearing message. Notice also there are bonds that explain why the letters stick to the backboard or to the medium of the message, just as in the DNA case. But those bonds also, the chemical or the magnetic attraction in this case, doesn't explain the sequential arrangement of the letters. So the forces of attraction that are in play here, the magnetic forces, do not explain the sequential arrangement of the letters that constitutes the message or the information that the message contains. And I can prove that the magnetic forces aren't responsible because we can actually rearrange the, the letters and generate not information, but gibberish. Same forces of attraction, now no information. You might also think about what does cause the information in that, in that message bearing sequence. In any case, um, this problem of prebiotic chemistry not explaining the origin of information or chem the chemistry of DNA not explaining the origin of information in DNA was recognized even before Kenyon by one of the great physical chemists of the 20th century, a man named Michael Polanyi, who was also a great friend and colleague of, of Albert Einstein. In an important article he wrote in 1968 called Life Transcending Physics and Chemistry, he, he explained it this way. He said, as the arrangement of the printed page, he's talking about ink on paper, he says, as the arrangement of the printed page is extraneous to the chemistry of the printed page, so is the base sequence in the DNA molecule extraneous to the chemical forces that work in the DNA molecule. Polanyi is basically saying, we wouldn't explain the origin of the information on a page by reference to the bonding between the ink and the paper. Something else is responsible for that information. And by the way, if the, in the DNA case, if the bonding affinities between the different amino, or between the different bases, nucleotide bases, were responsible for the information, or the sequencing, what we'd end up with would be something much more like a crystal, where you would have a repeating sequence of the same letters, A, T, A, T, A, T, A, T, A, T, for example, just as we have in a crystal, N, A, C, L, N, A, C, L, N, A, C, L. Such a sequence, according to information scientists, isn't information rich, rather they call such a sequence ordered or redundant, the same thing over and over again. It's not information. Order and information are not the same thing in information theory. So, in summary, the, this idea of self-organization or self-organization by forces of chemical necessity didn't end up working. Kenyon had to reject his own theory. And in 1985, I was able to hear, um, this story takes one more interesting twist. I attended a conference where Kenyon gave one of his first big talks where he publicly announced that he had rejected his own theory, in part because he realized it couldn't explain the origin of biological information, neither the information in proteins nor the information in DNA. At that time, I became fascinated with the subject, having heard Kenyon talk about this information problem. And a year later, later I left the a job I was doing as a geophysicist and went to Cambridge, where I ended up doing my dissertation, 
on origin of life biology. That's how I got into the subject. In any case, in his 1985 talk, Kenyon indicated that he had come to think that the information in DNA might be pointing to an intelligent source of some kind. In other words, to intelligent design. Now, I've become persuaded of that idea too, but before I explain why, let's look at one more fully naturalistic approach to explaining the origin of information. This approach combines chance and necessity, and we need to look at that next. For now, I'd like you to read chapter 11 in Signature in the Cell, where you can learn more about Kenyon's story and why his idea of self-organization and other self-organizational theories have failed to explain the origin of the information in DNA, RNA, and proteins. Thanks a lot.